Well, there is a lot to talk about. Let's get straight to our panel. Joining us from New York is Michael Zakur. He's Vice President of Global Digital Commerce and New Retail at Tompkins International. He's also the author of China's Super Consumers. Aina Tangen joins us from Beijing. He's a current affairs commentator. Lester Munson joins us here in Washington. He's Vice President of BGR Group, a government relations firm. And from Los Angeles, we're joined by Kevin Cloudon. He's the Executive Director of the Milken Institute Center for Regional Economics. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Let's start in New York with uh, Michael Zakur. And Michael, uh, as we just heard, there could be a deal uh, being signed between China and the United States very soon, could be as soon as tomorrow. Um, this, these negotiations have been going on for months, but how important is it for both these countries to settle their differences as soon as possible and possibly see a removal of those tariffs? Well, it's extremely important. This is, um, you know, from our point of view at Tompkins, the settlement here, the deal that's going to be made, is not the end of a process. In our opinion, it's actually the start of a longer-term process. Um, the bilateral relationship between the United States and China is going to be the most important global economic, political, cultural relationship for the foreseeable future. I think certainly from Beijing's side, um, what we know about Chinese negotiation style, the signing of the contract is just the beginning of the negotiation. Um, but certainly it's a positive in that it will release the tension that's built up over the last year and will provide a good starting point for the bigger issues that the two, company, the two countries um, need to cooperate and collaborate on for the next 50 years. Right. Michael, how vital will it be for these tariffs, if not all of them, but some of them to be lifted? Um, yeah, so I'm hearing that it's, it's very likely that most of um, the tariffs will stay in place for the foreseeable future once the deal is struck. Uh, there is going to be a graduated loosening of the tariffs dependent on the Chinese side living up to the commitments they're going to make in this deal. Uh, but as far as we can see, the short term, most of the tariffs will be in place. And that's okay because after a year now, the effects of the tariffs have already been priced in. Um, to products entering the United States. Um, they've largely been priced in to products entering China. So barring any escalation of the tariffs, a gradual de-escalation and lifting of them um, is going to be a positive. Okay, let's get the view from Beijing. Aina Tang and China has invested a lot uh, in a comprehensive trade agreement with the United States. It's being negotiated at a very high level. Given the slowdown in the Chinese economy, how important is it and how much urgency is there in China for this deal to be signed pretty quickly? Well, I think there's a lot of urgency. They're feeling the heat uh, here. Uh, but uh, the, the real question is, what are the long-term effects? As um, one of the colleagues mentioned earlier, this is the start of a new process. And there's still going to be a lot of political uncertainty as this goes forward, because will uh, Donald Trump keep to this uh, agreement? He's been notorious in the past for kind of uh, backsliding on things. So, you know, it's not just the Chinese who uh, uh, sign agreements and then uh, decide that they want to negotiate. But more importantly, consider this aspect that uh, Donald Trump is going to play this card when it's politically most advantageous to him. I mean, this is the way that he, he uh, reacts to things. So Beijing will be looking at exactly when he look, wants to implement this as they go forward. But yes, very important to the Chinese economy because it's important to the world economy. We're seeing some real softness, some real slowdown, Brexit, a number of other issues. Uh, Japan is having a, a tough time. So you're starting to see this uh, kind of cascade. People are concerned about a recession. And then how do you uh, dig yourself out given the current uh, situation both in Europe and, uh, and the U.S. Uh, who are still trying to recover from the 2008-2009 uh, fiasco. Lester, I want to get your opinion on one of the points that Anna Tangan just raised there, and that is the politics of all of this. There could be a deal signed very soon. If it is, how much of a victory will this be for President Trump? Well, I think uh, in many ways, you know, we're seeing the end of the negotiations, but we're seeing, we're about to see the beginning of the Washington uh, kind of soap opera approach to this deal. Uh, once the deal becomes known, it's going to be analyzed on the Hill by Democrats in particular, but also by Republicans. Both parties have staked out tough lines on China 
Democrats in particular are supportive of some of the president's trade measures. Republicans are a little more concerned on the security side about issues like Huawei and ZTE. Uh -huh. So I think once the deal comes out, then, it, then the Washington apparatus is really going to begin to chew on it and take a look at it, and people are going to uh, establish their positions on the deal. Because one, what we're hearing from these talks is that one of the sticking points right now is how the deal is going to be implemented. Uh, is that what you're talking about? Is that what still has to be decided? It's, it's a little bit more than just the implementation. I think politically, Democrats are going to look to see any weakness in the president's approach. One of the things that the White House has been downplaying has been uh, discussions of Huawei or ZTE. They've been, talk, they've been saying good things about intellectual property uh, rights for American companies. People are going to look at that issue very closely. And if, in fact, the White House or the administration is taking a light approach on the Huawei issue, you can expect a ton of criticism from Capitol Hill. All right, let's bring in Kevin Cloud. And Kevin, uh, when we look at China and the United States, of course, this is the biggest trade relationship in the world. And China, of course, is the main trading partner for dozens of other countries. So how important will an agreement be, not just for the U.S. and China, but for the global community? Well, in a lot of ways, it really reflects a need for stability. Everybody has been waiting not just on whether or not this gets resolved, but whether or not it escalates. A number of countries have been concerned not only about whether or not there would be a new round of tariffs, if there would be a larger conflict from a trade standpoint that Europe might get dragged into, that Latin America might get dragged into, and that countries would be forced to choose sides where they would have no winners. So if this is a positive move, even though some countries might have benefited a bit in the short term from the disruption of the U.S.-China relationship, everybody agrees long term that they need some sort of predictability and stability. And uh, do you expect confidence globally to increase? Well, I expect confidence to globally to increase in this regard. I think there are a number of other factors going around right now that were just previously mentioned that are eating away at confidence. Mostly it comes down to is that the global economy doesn't need a larger scale conflict, and that at least will help things in the short term. Lester, looking more broadly at the manufacturing landscape in the United States, we know that thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, have moved to other countries or have been lost completely here in the United States. Uh, President Trump still believes that those jobs can come back. Let's listen to some of what he's been saying about that. We have companies coming back into our country, some of them left years ago. We took historic and dramatic action to save the American auto industry. In everything we do, in every action we take, we're putting America first. Is that politics or are these jobs coming back? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. It's, yeah. it's probably not terrific economics, but it's very good politics. The core of the president's support in 2016 came from states like Michigan and Ohio, Wisconsin, where there was a real manufacturing base that's eroded over time. So when the president talks about these issues, he's speaking to those uh, usually white voters who haven't gone to college. That's kind of the demographic. And he, it's, it has great appeal for that uh, constituency. He won that vote overwhelmingly. It's what propelled him to the White House. He has been making very extravagant promises, though, Lester. Is he going to be able to fulfill them? Probably not. Uh, he, he tends to, you know, uh, exaggerate what he's going to be able to do. But yeah. I, I strongly suspect that his supporters appreciate the fact that he is fighting for them. They're less right. concerned about the results, and they're more impressed by the fact that finally, some, in their view, finally someone is fighting for their interests in Washington. Mm -hmm. Anna Tangan, if we look at manufacturing in China, Reuters has a report, Arch, which says that factory activity grew in China in March, and that's the first time that's happened in four months. Uh, what does that tell us, that the government stimulus program is taking hold, is working? Well, it's one data point, so it's, it's important to start looking at the trend. Let's, let's look a, a couple months forward. But it does increase people's confidence in the sense that uh, China is a responsible player. It's predictable. You know, we've heard uh, the other commentators say that the world needs predictability, and I would completely agree with that. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the Chinese manufacturing has pushed up. We'll see if that continues. Uh, but there have been confidence um, measures that have been done. This tax cut, especially at the low end, seems to having a, a lot of effect because they're pushing money at the base as opposed to trying to see it trickle down from the top through fiscal economy. So very, very important on that side. In terms of uh, Donald Trump's uh, approach 
uh, to China. I, I don't know that he's necessarily doing himself any good. He's sending a lot of mix, mixed messages. For instance, this uh, that's tussle over Taiwan, uh, sending uh, ships through there. He's mixing security issues uh, that are at the core of the Chinese uh, pow uh, sense of national identity. Uh, and then at the same time trying to use that in this trade negotiation. That's a very dangerous line, and it's, uh, it's already crossing uh, what the Chinese see as the red line for them. Michael Zucker, the uh, International Monetary Fund Managing Director, Christine Lagarde, here in Washington, she said that the global economy is lo has lost further momentum in January, and she attributes that to these trade tensions between the U.S. and China, and to financial tightening as well. Uh, this is what she had to say. Let's watch this. We believe that we are in, in this sort of delicate moment where uh, the growth momentum has slowed down and has slowed down pretty much across the board. Uh, we see 70% of our global economy slowing down compared with what we had anticipated uh, a few months ago. So this is widely uh, spread and it's likely to improve in the course of 2019 um, where we see a little bit of an, uh, an, an upswing to be expected. But it's delicate because there is a lot of uncertainty. Well, Michael, we have heard that before, a lot of uncertainty. But what do you make of Ms. Lagarde's sentiments there? And when she talks about loss in momentum, what impact does that have in a country like the United States? Well, <clears throat> I think she's absolutely correct. Uh, we keep hearing that word uncertainty, and we look at um, certainly Brexit in Europe. Uh, we've still seen a, a really slow recovery in the last 10 years in the EU as a whole. Uh, the situation in Venezuela has South America on tenterhooks, certainly the situation with the United States and China. So no matter where we look in the world in terms of global trade, geopolitics, geoeconomics, um, it's a very unsettled time. <clears throat> the deal going forward between the China and the United States is one opportunity to settle things down a bit from a um, global point of view. What the global economy really needs right now is Chinese consumers to spend. Um, Chinese consumers, uh, you know, there are 800 million of them now with significant levels of disposable income. There's a, been a little bit of a retreat. Um, on Chinese consumption rates, and that has a lot to do with the uncertainty with the U.S.-China situation, with the global economy. Um, but we need Chinese consumers to open up their wallets again and start buying American products and European products and South American products. That's really what's going to put, let's put it this way, the, the Chinese economy uh, is accounting for roughly 27 percent of total global growth over the last 10 years. That has slowed significantly. The best tonic for that problem globally will be the Chinese consumer spending like they were a year or two ago. Well, let me get Anna Tangan's uh, thoughts on that. Anna Tangan, do you s expect uh, a big increase in consumer spending in China uh, after this deal is signed? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think there will be uh, a lot more confidence, but there, there's been some damage there. I think uh, American goods uh, will face some uphill battles, especially with the Europeans trying to kind of get into the things. Now, uh, in, in regards to uh, this whole idea of keeping these tariffs in place, remember, these tariffs are really going to affect the consumers on both sides. American goods will be more expensive or less profitable versus their European counterparts. So this idea that somehow you're going to price this in does not take into uh, fact that uh, you know, the U.S. goods just won't be that competitive. And they might not be as attractive to U.S. consumers, especially if there's this continued kind of uh, hitting away at uh, ZTE and Huawei, which are considered very, very good brands here in China. And uh, there could be repercussions on Apple and a number of other uh, consumables. Um, there's, remember, a huge market here in China for U.S. goods. These are companies that are based and produced here. But they could start feeling real heat if this uncertainty continues. Kevin Clown, uh, you know, we hear things like lack of confidence, uncertainty, et cetera. But if we, if we look at one metric here in the United States, and uh, this is something I hope you're going to help us uh, understand, and that is, despite the slowdown, the number of jobless people in the United States continues to drop. So where are the new jobs, and what does that tell us about where the U.S. economy is heading? Well, it's 
somewhat misleading because what you see is that the number of jobless people are dropping for two reasons. One is there are a number of part-time jobs, a lot of gig economy jobs. There are some jobs where for a long time companies have been reluctant to hire workers because there hasn't been a skills match and they've been more willing due to demand to actually hire people that they considered a little more marginal in terms of their qualifications. The bigger issue is the workforce participation rate. That has actually been improving lately, which is a very positive sign. But if you look at the overall strength of workforce participation, it's still not as strong in the US, relatively speaking, as it was before the Great Recession. The real question is that as you've seen fewer and fewer people available to fill these various jobs, are there enough individuals with the skills needed to go into what is now more high-tech manufacturing, more advanced processes that aren't the old classic jobs that President Trump had been viewing, a manufacturing job that just required graduating high school. Now you need a two-year degree or you need some sort of programming skill or something that makes it a bit harder for these jobs to get filled. Lester, talking about uh, programming and skills, uh as we talked a moment ago, uh, many parts of the United States have lost their manufacturing base, and there have been calls for retraining. There was something uh, interesting that the Apple CEO, Tim Cook, had to say about that. Let's watch that. China put an enormous focus on manufacturing in, the, in what we would call, you and I would call vocational kind of skills. The U.S. over time began to stop having as many vocational kind of skills. I mean, you could take every tool, die, tool and die maker in the United States and probably put them in the room they were currently sitting in. In China, you would have to have multiple football fields. So if the United States is going to change that, uh, does it have to play catch up now? Well, one of the things I think the U.S. should be exploring, and it, and it really isn't right now, is education reform. There's plenty of government intervention into the economic uh, marketplace of education, uh, all kinds of uh, standards imposed from on high. What the U.S. should really do is relax those restrictions, relax those regulations, allow the free market to uh, encourage companies to promote the kind of training that they need. That'll make the U.S. more responsive to the global market. It'll be better for U.S. workers, and frankly, it'll make for cheaper education. And it'll be a lot of retraining as well, right? It's going to be, it, you have to go through the whole workforce, starting from uh, grade school, high school, college. Uh, vocational training and yes, retraining current workers to meet the new demand. We should have less regulation, less government involvement. The, the strength of the United States is the free market. We should use that strength in this situation. Ina Tang, if we look at the situation in China, it faces a similar sort of challenge with the advent of artificial intelligence, uh, robotic technology. Uh, do the Chinese have a backup plan to uh, fill in those positions you know, when, when robotics and artificial uh, intelligence takes over those jobs? Well, there's a feeling that uh, the, co the country that prepares its workers for the future economy is going to win uh, the race in that particular regard, and I would completely agree. I, I would disagree with this idea that it's all in the market. The Chinese approach is going to be to institute a, a vocational training uh, track uh, that hopefully will begin somewhere at high school, which will allow basically three options. One, you go vocational. That means that you will, have, uh, you will learn in the classroom, but also in a workplace setting. Uh, two, you will go straight college, uh, where you're looking to go into a, a university or ac a continued academics. And the third one would be a mixture of those two that gives you an option uh, at either end. So uh, I think they're going to be uh, pushing this. It needs resources. It needs organization. I don't necessarily think that the free market is attuned to that. It's too short term. This is a long term battle, and it's going to be fought uh, by countries and won by those who are prepared. Michael Zucker, uh, you know, getting back to the trade talks that have been taking place, the United States has expressed concern, in fact, deep concern, over one of China's programs, and that's called the Made in China 2025 program. Why that concern? Well, I think it comes back to what we were just talking about, you know, who is going to win the race to the future. Uh, coming back to the idea that the free market will decide who does and who does not get left behind, uh, what's happened over the last 30 years is that the free market has chosen automation. 80% of all manufacturing jobs that have disappeared from the United States in the last 30 years have gone to automation, not to offshore. The idea that we're going to bring back 
jobs where we're making socks and plastic toys and low-tech, dirty output goods, low-margin goods in the United States, and that's going to help us, is patently ridiculous. Chinese manufacturers right now are starting to offshore the dirty, low-cost, low-margin manufacturing to Southeast Asia, to India, to Bangladesh. They're moving those jobs out of China. The idea that they would come back to, or that we would want them to come back to the United States, is patently ridiculous. That's number one. Number two, the Made in China 2025 comes around to the other side of that equation, which is China saying, we want to move away from that and towards building artificial intelligence, technology-based industries, moving up the value chain. We want to build rocket ships, not toy rockets in China. That's what Made in China 2025 is about. It's about harnessing the power of technology, data science, artificial intelligence, and owning the future. The future is about supply chain, who owns supply chain and trade routes. It's about the evolution of digital commerce, e-commerce, and high technology. And it's about the battle who's going to be on top for global digital supremacy. Kevin Cloud, let me get your thoughts on this. Uh, right now, China has a significant, uh, I would say, advantage in high-skilled, um, high-tech manufacturing, skilled workers in high-tech manufacturing. How does the U.S. compete with China there? Well, the main advantage the United States has is to invest in advanced processes and to be able to take risks in a lot of ways, both in terms of technology coming out of the university system, there's a much more effective tech transfer process in the US than there is in China. And there is admittedly also a much better investment market, particularly in terms of venture capital, private equity, and otherwise to fund companies that might not otherwise get a chance. What China really has is a tremendous capacity that the United States has difficulty to manage, both in terms of the sheer number of people, but also in terms of the number of skilled workers. But China is not as set up as well for risk taking. So if the U.S. is going to be able to actually continue to lead, it's got to not only take risks and to attract innovators, but it also has to be very careful about attracting and keeping skilled workers and these risk takers who come from overseas because they can't take those chances, whether it's in India or it's in China or Korea or in Europe. Lester, one final point I want to talk about, and this gets back to the trade talks that are taking place. I mean, one of the complaints that President Trump had about China right after he came into office was the trade deficit between the two countries. Looking at what we know about these trade talks right now, do you see that gap closing in the near future? Uh, probably not. In fact, during the Trump administration, the, the trade deficit has actually gotten larger despite all the tariffs and uh, his willingness to employ tools that others wouldn't use. But what Politically, what voters, again, are looking for is for him to be a fighter, for him to be addressing the issue. So his energy in that area is what, is what really benefits him. Most voters aren't looking at the, the small numbers through green eye shades about what the trade deficit actually is with China. So I think he's, he's doing OK on that, even though the numbers don't look that great for him. It's all about optics, isn't it? It's all about optics. And it's hanging on the other side of that equation. Uh you know, is whether China is preparing to import more from the United States. Do you see that undertaking or assurance coming from the Chinese? Yeah, I mean, there's been, the plan has been in place for quite some time. Uh, the real question is, what is the disruption, disruption to other markets? I mean, we've just had this kind of seesaw thing going on. They imposed tariffs a year ago, and all of a sudden, Brazilian soybeans are in demand, and the U.S. aren't. And now, if this goes forward, you're going to see a lot of energy deals, a lot of agricultural deals. But that's going to have a, a, a follow-on effect to these other economies. And they're not, those economies are not doing well. So this uncertainty is really uh, the, the issue here. And the, it's not just uncertainty over what's going to happen, but what happens afterwards. How is Donald Trump going to play this? And this is one of the, the crucial factors that nobody at this point knows. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, DC. Thanks for being with us.